Uh, we're about to begin our final afternoon panel, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to Professor James Davis. Thank you so much, and, and again, thanks for all of the people who had a terrific um, role in making this uh, a huge success. Uh, it's been great all day long, and we all look forward to tomorrow. Earlier during my presentation, I developed a case of dry mouth instantly because of medicine that I'm taking, but I remembered a comment made to me by one of my former students who's now a professional singer, and she said, bite your tongue if you get dry mouth, and it works. It got me out of the, of the session earlier in the day, but now I have a groove in my tongue, so it looks a little bit grotesque. We have three fine presenters in this session. Uh, now, I'll, I'll present all three of them, and then they can come up uh, independently, and afterwards we'll have a Q&A. This session runs until 4.45, so we do have uh, plenty of time. The first um, presenter is, is Michael Allen. He uh, has his bachelor's degree from Central Washington State College, his MA from the University of Montana, and a PhD from the Washington, uh, uh, University of Washington at Seattle. He's currently professor of, uh, at the University of Washington at, at Tacoma. He's written six books. Among them is um, a work um, uh, entitled Western Riverman, 1860, 1763 to 1861. And I had the good fortune to review that book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a first-rate book, still, still published in paperback, and uh, I recommend that greatly. Another work of his is, is uh, Congress in the West, 1783 to 87, and he's working on a work called Mississippi River Valley. I might add, too, that Mike uh, is, is a hero. He um, uh, left uh, Washington about midnight last night. He flew to Dallas. He, from Dallas, he flew uh, elsewhere, and he got in uh, just a short time ago. So he, he's going to present a heroic uh, talk today. Uh, and, <laughs> And we're, we're with him. Our next speaker is John Butler. John Butler has his bachelor's degree and PhD from the University of Minnesota. He is a, a prof a currently professor emeritus at Yale University. And just recently, he was elected president of the Organization of American Historians. Congratulations on that achievement. His notable publications include A Wash in a Sea of Faith, Becoming America, the Revolution Before 1776, and these, he's the co-author author of A Short History of Religion in America. Our third speaker is John Tiford. His PhD is from the University of Wisconsin. He's a professor emeritus at Purdue University, and among his publications is a, a work entitled um, Cities of the Heartland. So it's my pleasure to present these presenters to you today. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Allen, uh, and I grew up on the Columbia Plateau of Eastern Washington State. I, I came in on the last uh, session, and people talking about their. So you know, when I was growing up, I was just kind of imagined the Midwest, and uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to go somewhere where there were fireflies. I knew that. I, I wanted to see a firefly, and so I made it. Uh, I'm, I call this talk today uh, "The View from the River." Uh, another perspective of the Midwest, not, not the only perspective or not the only viewpoint of the Midwest, but an important viewpoint to, to look at the Midwestern life and history and culture. Stand at the Cumberland Gap and watch the procession of civilization marching single file. The buffalo following the trail to the salt springs, the Indian, the fur trader and hunter, cattle raiser, the pioneer farmer, and the frontier has passed by. Now, Frederick Jackson Turner was certainly right that the mountain passes and the early American trails were a course for civilization into the Trans-Appalachian Trans West. Uh, but so too were the river systems. Indeed, uh, uh, I could take the above quote and I'm going to and substitute uh, 
stand at the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela where they form the Ohio, or uh, stand beneath St. Anthony's Falls on Minnesota's upper Mississippi River. Um, stand where the Ohio joins the Mississippi at Cairo. Stand where the Missouri River is joined by the Kansas, Kansas City and Independence. Um, or, or stand in Missouri near the juncture of the Missouri, Illinois, and Mississippi Rivers. And then you plug in the rest of the, of the paragraph there. But I'm going to add a few things. Uh, to, uh, to that list that Turner gave us that started with buffalo and, and uh, Indians and uh, um, I'll add mound builders and explorers and town builders, rivermen, soldiers, frontier folk heroes, governmental leaders, freedom fighters, religious communities, writers, artists, movie makers and musicians. Uh, we can stand at those junctures of river systems and we can see all of those people pass by too over the course of, uh, of th hundreds and uh, indeed uh, referencing mound builders thousands of years. Uh, talking about Midwestern river systems today, I, I begin by uh, acknowledging uh, to be sure that uh, many of the Midwestern rivers drain uh, the Great Lakes and uh, eventually the St. The Saint Lawrence and into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Indeed, the Great River, Red River Valley drains uh, Lake Winnipeg in Canada. Uh, but what I'd like to talk about today is what I see as the heartland or the trunk, la trunk lines of the Midwestern river system uh, which are, of course, the upper Mississippi Valley rivers, uh, the, the great rivers, the, the upper Mississippi, the Ohio and the Missouri, and then there, there are many tributaries, uh, the Miami, the Wabash, uh, the Illinois, uh, the, the Minnesota, the Wisconsin, uh, the, as I mentioned, the Kansas River and the Missouri system. Uh, this is, this is the, the heart, these are the rivers of the heartland. Uh, you know, the, this, this, this is the heart of America. And, uh, and so uh, I don't want to neglect the, I mean, here we are in Grand, Rap here we are in Grand Rapids, and uh, you know, this ain't flowing into the Mississippi River here. Uh, it's heading in another direction. And so there is that too, and I want to write about that, but today I'm just going to look at the upper Mississippi River Valley and uh, those river systems. And uh, really, in doing that, we can begin with urban geography, just uh, standing today and looking today at where we are and what the valley looks like, and referencing what I began saying. Uh, Pitts, you know, you look at the major cities, and before the invention of the railroad, and it's all about the rivers. I mean, beginning with the mound builders, really, and Cahokia. Uh, but then Pittsburgh at the junction of the Allegheny and Monongahela, Cincinnati, where the Miami enters the Ohio, uh, Marietta, the first uh, uh, American town in the Old Northwest uh, situated uh, on the Ohio River. The, um, um, I referred to St. Anthony's Falls and the situation of the Twin Cities. St. Louis, my gosh, you know, right where the Illinois and the Missouri come in there. The, these are where these great cities were originally found, and it's no great mystery why they're there. They're there because it was before the railroad, and that's where the commerce and, and the settlement and all, the, all of the trappings of civili civilization coursed along those uh, veins. Um, in tracing the history of the upper Mississippi Valley, uh, the rivers are, um, are essential. Uh, we begin with mound builders, Hopewellian and Mississippian mound builders, um, and uh, these great structures, uh, uh, some of which are still uh, with us today, east of St. Louis, I always think of Cahokia, and a wonderful site to visit and get some extent. of uh, the, These bottomland, uh, or some idea of these bottomland agriculturalists and the kinds of civilization that they built there, uh, within sight of the river, and indeed standing atop the mounds, and they looked out over the rivers, and that became part of their spirituality 
as well as their economic uh, system and their, and their military defense system. Um, the, the woodland Indian villages also often, not always, uh, approximated the river or were connected to river systems. Um, then came the European explorers, and especially from the north in the upper Mississippi Valley, the French uh, were the first, uh, much later than the Spaniards below, but uh, they followed the rivers then, the upper Mississippi, the Illinois, uh, Marquette, Joliet, LaSalle, um, sailing southward looking for, uh, looking for a route uh, to the Orient and instead finding the mouth of the Arkansas River and eventually the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but uh, the history of the valley is traced then in very, from very early days on along the courses of these rivers. Um, this also applies to military history. And the military history would begin with mound builders and Indian warfare um, uh, situ situated along the river systems. Uh, but then, uh, and then into the French and Indian Wars in the upper Ohio Valley. Uh, but then with the American Revolution, there's Kaskaskis in Vincennes on the Mississippi and Wabash, uh, respectively, and characters like George Rogers Clark. And, uh, and a little bit later, uh, a fellow named Aaron Burr sailing down the Ohio River, stopping at Blennerhassett uh, Island and... Uh, uh, and then going on uh, looking for money. You know, they say uh, it, it was always other people's money that was burning a hole in Aaron Burr's pockets, you know. And, uh, and then Blender Hassett's Island becomes the focal point for the treason case against Burr. Lewis and Clark uh, actually preceding Burr down the Ohio, up the Mississippi, then up the Missouri in 1803 and 1804. And uh, so uh, there's this military presence uh, very early on. And in the War of 1812, the, the focal point of Prophetstown at the confluence of the Tippecanoe and the Wabash River then is a very important uh, uh, aspect of that war and the making of William Henry Harrison uh, and, uh, and the Shawnee Prophet, and who I'm going to return to here in just a second. Then the, and then, of course, there's Black Hawk's War on the upper Mississippi River um, uh, later on into the 19th century. And um, most people think of the lower for the Civil War because of Vicksburg and, um, and, uh, and Shiloh and Farragut in New Orleans. But really, Grant uh, earns his spurs uh, in the lower Midwest, beginning at Cairo over into Missouri, and then the mouths of the Cumberland and the Tennessee Rivers uh, when he begins uh, his movement towards Shiloh and eventually Vicksburg and the river systems are so crucial in the military history of the Civil War um, at that particular time in history. There's a, there's a whole economic group of riverboat men who emerged very early on and are still with us today in the, in the economic sector and the role of the rivers in the Midwest. Uh, this begins again with mound builders and with indigenous people and, and the long canoes and the bull boats um, but uh, with the formation of the early American Republic and uh, victories in Indian Wars, then come uh, the series of, uh, of river craft. At first, pre-industrial or pre-steam pre craft, uh, flat boats, these flat bottom boats, which in fact are, are um, uh, their primitive ancestors of steel barges, the steel barges that we, uh, that we see today on the western rivers. Uh, and flatboat men, and farmer flatboat men, and women coming down the Ohio uh, River and the other river systems uh, to settle those lands after the American Revolution. Uh, the keelboats were up upstream craft, pushed or pulled upstream before the invention of the steamboat in a very laborious uh, and skillful manner. Uh, the lumber rafts, the great lumber rafts coming down from the Wisconsin pineries the upper Mississippi River to St. Louis and beyond. And then finally, uh, in 1811, the first steamboat, uh, which didn't put these other boats out of business really immediately. You know, there's, kind of, there's this kind of interesting 20 or 30 year period when the steamboats are there, but the flatboats are there too in increasing numbers. Why? Because they now had a ride home. Uh, they could take a flatboat south, downstream, non-motorized and then grab a steamboat 
home. They became commuters. Flatboatmen became some of the earliest commuters going home, making another trip. Uh, the railroads, however, change all of that, and this is one of the things we're going to be talking about over the next couple of days, is the, the river towns turning their back to the river as the railroads uh, give, give another uh, important transportation um, component to the history of the Midwest. Uh, finally, there's the towboats, and this is something that I, I don't think has been explored nearly as much as should be. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, I'm... Perhaps I'm being selfish I, because I worked on towboats for three years and I got real interested in that. But, you know, why is it that truck drivers have a mystique and NASCAR guys have a mystique? But, you know, where, where's the towboat mystique? Where's the country western songs about towboat? And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit more today. But that's an interesting aspect of the Midwest that's still with us today, these towboat barges uh, coursing the rivers uh, up and downstream. Uh, race and issues of race, the rivers um, uh, parallel. And uh, the, um, from the beginning of the Republic, the Ohio River was a dividing line between the Old Southwest and the Old Northwest. And the Mississippi served as a de facto uh, dividing line uh, between uh, slaveholding Missouri and, uh, and the free state of Illinois. Uh, slaves were shipped on the Ohio and uh, Mississippi rivers and the tributary systems. Uh, but as uh, Tom Buchanan uh, showed us, slaves and many free blacks also worked on steamboats and, uh, and the Western Rivers boats during the early decades and the later decades of the 19th century. Uh, perhaps Alton, Illinois can serve as a, um, as a symbol of the strife of slavery and the role of the rivers and the murder of Elijah P. Lovejoy in Alton, Illinois, because of his abolitionist views, as, a, as one of many uh, uh, causes leading to the Civil War. Uh, folkways, uh, well, I, when, I, when I think of river folklore in the Ohio and Mississippi Valleys, upper Mississippi Valleys, two characters come to mind who are very different. Uh, John Chapman, uh, Johnny Appleseed, uh, who uh, followed the river valleys uh, and, uh, and planted trees, actually began east of the Appalachian Mountains, but uh, made his way down the Allegheny and the Ohio, uh, shipping apple seeds on the Ohio River, uh, with an important religious component to his historic life and the mythic life uh, that, uh, that overtook that and that we still have, a, have with us today. And then on the other hand, uh, Big Mike Fink, uh, who was not a devout fellow, uh, the king of the river, you know, Big Mike Fink, uh, who eventually died in 1823, and we don't know why or how he died, died literally where the Yellowstone River joins the Missouri River on the North, North Dakota line. He was shot up there. Uh, uh, we're not exactly, uh, no, we don't exactly know what was involved except probably uh, liquor, and, uh, and it was a hard life. And Fink's, Fink's hard life led to many folk tales and stories about him that involved shooting whiskey cups off of people's heads and, uh, and, uh, um, and also violent and, and racist tales that tell us a lot about folk culture and popular culture during the decades uh, leading to the Civil War. And so there's a, lot of, you know, there's a lot of folklore here, not just verbal folklore either, um, houseboats and houseboat uh, lifestyle, fishing camps. Uh, there's a lot of nonverbal or partly verbal folkways attached to these river systems uh, that are very important. Uh, food. Uh, and this is from a book I'm writing. Fried fish was very important to the Midwestern diet as the Western rivers provided bountiful, fatty, bottom-feeding catfish, perch, bass, and carp. Cooks, uh, uh, they cook small catfish, fiddlers whole, and they cut the big ones into steaks, cut vertically to the bone. Then they breaded them in cornmeal or flour and fried them golden brown in about a half inch of lard or bacon grease. And, you know, that's kind of a high point, I think, of, uh, of uh, 19th century cuisine and 20th century cuisine. Garrison, Garrison Keillor makes fun of Scandinavian foodways uh, on the upper Mississippi River and all these jokes about lutefisk and prune whip and chicken surprise. But you know, he, uh, he gives himself away in Lake Wobegon 
days when he jokes about the Moonlight Bay Supper Club uh, with 40 booze, with tablecloths and candles and glass bowls that reflected on the mirror, the back bar. And he knows those upper Mississippi River supper clubs. And he knows the food is not bad there. The food's pretty good. And uh, fried fish, certainly, but pork roast and T-bone steaks as well. And they still serve frog legs in, a, in Galena, or at least the last time I was there at the cabin, they do and did. Um, political. The political history of the valley as tied to the river. Working on the river or having a connection on the river soon became part of the resume of every uh, Midwestern politician uh, uh, that wanted to get somewhere. Henry Clay, Harry of the West, Jack, and his nemesis, Andrew Jackson, of course. But most importantly, Abraham Lincoln and his two flatboat trips to New Orleans, uh, where he supposedly saw a slave auction and vowed to hit it hard if he ever got a chance to do something about that. I don't know if that ever happened or not. Uh, you know, but it should have happened. Uh, it should have happened. And this becomes part of the, uh, of the Lincoln mythology, his two flatboat trips to New Orleans. In the environment and recreation, uh, flooding the Army Corps of Engineers, and, um, and the environmental degradation accompanying industrialization on the upper Mississippi River um, and the Ohio these are, and Missouri. These are all issues that are very important today and are woven into the history of the Midwest. Religion, too. Uh, the, the rivers were the conduit of the Second Great Awakening uh, in some ways. Not always, but in, in some ways. And um, um, Nauvoo, Illinois. My gosh. And it's not only a religious town, because the Mormons went there after they were uh, thrown out of Missouri in the late 30s, but it's also a river town. And, you know, with rafting, they had a steamboat, they had a monopoly on the ferry, ferry trade between Montrose, uh, Iowa, and the Illinois shore. And they were, they were river people, as well as Latter-day Saints. Uh, one of the great scenes in American religious history, or one of the most striking, is the Mormons crossing the frozen Mississippi uh, leaving Nauvoo in the mid-1840s on their way to Salt Lake City. Although some never left, and that's another part of the river's history, Joseph Smith III, who stays in Nauvoo and crosses the Mississippi on a rowboat with his mother, Emma, in 1860 to go to uh, uh, Amboy in Illinois and found the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so, you know, there's a lot there. Art, literature, painting, um, the Spoon River Anthology, Hamlin Garland, but uh, I did want to mention Dick Bissell today, Richard Bissell, Dubuque, Iowa. Ring a bell, anybody? Uh, he wrote The Pajama Game, which is what folks know, but he also wrote these towboat novels and a wonderful autobiography called My Life on the Mississippi, or Why I Am Not Mark Twain. And, you know, I like that. That's, a, I like, that's my favorite subtitle, I think, Why I Am Not Mark Twain. Uh, and then there's the pajama game. Uh, well, finally, and I'm going to end here with popular culture, movies, uh, well, Broadway musicals, uh, some of which, not all, are made into movies uh, uh, that have these river, Midwestern river backgrounds. Meet Me in St. Louis, uh, Judy Garland, actually not a Broadway uh, musical concocted for film alone, but then the Iowa musicals, uh, State Fair, where the Frake family follows the Des Moines River Valley literally on two-lane highways, taking that pig up to the state fair in Iowa, where they want to win the prize for the best uh, for the best uh, porker, and also for the uh, uh, what, do, what does Ma Frake make uh, mincemeat? Yeah, yeah, that they spike with uh, alcohol, and uh, and then of course uh, the pajama game, Dick Bissell about the union uh, uh, dispute in Dubuque. Uh, and the Music Man, right here in River City. Uh, I'm going to end with music because jazz came up the Mississippi River from the Delta in New Orleans uh, to St. Louis and to Kansas City, uh, Midwestern towns, and, and eventually Chicago, uh, not just by the rivers, but also the Illinois Central Railroad and Highway 61, the Great River Road, and thus jazz and blues, and eventually rock and roll, uh, uh, and Chuck Berry from St. Louis, an important uh, character and all of that, but Kansas City jazz, blues, St. Louis blues, and then of course Chicago blues 
uh, all connected to the rivers because, you know, Louis Armstrong got a job on the Streckfuss steamers in the 1920s and, uh, and uh, went north. And he went to Davenport, Iowa, and a young guy named Bix Beiderbeck heard him play, and he thought that was the greatest thing he'd ever heard in his life. And, um, and then there's John Hartford uh, from St. Louis and uh, his wonderful river songs, uh, often about diesel towboat men. And he's someone who has written about the diesel towboat men, and he won a Grammy for Mark Twain. Uh, or Mark Twain, not Mark Twain, Mark Twain, his album Mark Twain, John Hartford from St. Louis. Uh, he was a licensed towboat pilot. Um, well, I'm going to end with Bob Dylan. Uh, he listened to all of this on the radio and the phonograph of his Minnesota home uh, in the upper Mississippi River Valley. And as a, teenage, uh, as a teenager envisioned U.S. Highway 61, the Great River Road, as being something important to his life and wrote in the Chronicles, Highway 61, the main thoroughfare of the country blues, begins about where I came from, Duluth, to be exact. I always felt that I'd started on it, I always had been on it, and could go anywhere on it, even down into the deep delta country. It was the same road full of the same contradictions, the same one-horse towns, the same spiritual ancestors. The Mississippi River, the bloodstream of the blues, also starts up in my neck of the woods. I was never too far away from it, any of it. It was my place in the universe. I always felt it was in my blood. Thank you very much. I first want to thank um, David Good for having lunch with me after we moved back to Minneapolis after retiring from Yale University in 2011 and telling me about an effort to form a Midwestern Historical His History Association. And I want to thank John Lauk for inviting me to give a paper. And I want to thank you at the late afternoon for listening. Um, a question for a conference about an effort to renew interest in the history of the Midwest is, of course, what do we mean by the Midwest? And given my, given my topical charge, which happens to be religion in the Midwest, perhaps it's appropriate to say that my answer about geography parallels the answer on religion giving, that Henry Fielding gave to Parson Thwackham in Fielding's Tom Jones, which was published in 1749. In, by religion, Fielding had Twackham say that he meant, quote, the Christian religion, and not only the Christian religion, but the Protestant religion, and not only the Protestant religion, but the Church of England. By Midwest, I mean the land area between modern Ohio and Nebraska, but not Colorado, Tennessee, or Kentucky, and between the Canadian border and southern Missouri and Kansas, but probably not Arkansas, Oklahoma, or Texas. Now that's the easy part. Spiritual landscapes, that's the hard part. Historians have been more ecumenical than Parson Thwackham when discussing Midwestern religion, but not by much. Ultimately, historians have had to add European Catholics and now Hispanic and Vietnamese Catholics. Then they've added Jews, that is, as legitimate uh, religious participants in the Midwest and have slowly included American Indians, though they lumped them all together as though all American Indians had the same kinds of religion. But what about the Amish or the many different contemporary American Indian religious groups? Or the Westboro Baptist Church? Or the Orthodox tradition, not only Greek or Russian, but now Eritrean? Or modern Hasidic Jews, or Mennonites, or the Nation of Islam, or the Baha'i, or spiritualists, or Muslims, or Sikhs, or the remarkably persistent I Am movement founded in Chicago by Guy Ballard in the 1930s, whose St. Germain Foundation now is headquartered in Schaumburg, Illinois. In fact, the Midwest may defy Parson Thwackham's Protestant reductionism more boldly than any other American region. Christians pr predominate after 1850, but in bewildering and conflicted varieties, followed by Jews and then a mix of other religious groups that 
clearly outstrip religious diversity almost anywhere else in the United States. What then is a historian to do? Which spiritual landscape? landscape? Where? What religions are we discussing in the Midwest? I want to turn to a book about Indians and missionaries. A new book by Linda Clemens, a lovely recent book entitled Conflicted Mission, Faith, Disputes, and Deception on the Dakota Frontier, published last year by the Minnesota Historical Society, approaches these questions about religion and religions in the Midwest in exceptionally useful ways for historians of the Midwest. A study of ABCFM missionaries, that is, missionaries sponsored by the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions between the 1830s and the 1862 Dakota War, conflicted mission reminds us of the radically changed religious landscapes that have continued to typify the Midwest since the antebellum era, the conflicts and the resolutions that religious questions brought in the Midwest, the importance of understanding individual motivations in all believers, the complicated importance of institutions, and the government's role in shaping religion despite the First Amendment's prohibition against establishment. Certainly, conflicted mission cannot comprehend all the Midwest spiritual landscapes, but it may be a better guide than the traditional linear approaches to religion in a vigorously heterogeneous Midwest far from the common, if conflicting, stereotypes cast up by either Sinclair Lewis or Garrison Keillor. Clemens's book assumes that religious and cultural diversity and conflict are central to the Midwest spiritual landscapes. It explores the integrity of the actors in the Midwest spiritual drama before judging the consequences of their actions, in Clemens's case, missionaries and the Indians alike. And it assumes the character and force of religious complexity and change in the region, denying any pristine moment at any point of unalloyed spiritual purity corrupted through the passage of time or especially by modernity. If exceptional religious diversity disfigured or characterized the Midwest spiritual landscapes from the late 18th century into the 1950s, then rising again after 1990, this occurred precisely because religion was and remained important. Tolerance lagged stiff-necked religiosity by more than a little in the Midwest, and Midwesterners honored the First Amendment erratically. Karen Armstrong's recent book, Fields of Blood, Religion, and the History of Violence, it's a worldwide study, may largely absolve religion of major responsibility for violence across the centuries and across continents. But Armstrong could have described how Indian resentment against missionaries and European convictions that pagan Indians deserved no civilized privileges fueled the particularly brutal 1862 Dakota War. Equally implicit and explicit government-sponsored Christian missionizing authorized in President Grant's euphemistically named 1868 Peace Plan, which banned traditional relig Indian religious practice and farmed out Indian reservations to a wide swath of Protestant and Catholic missionaries, did not end until 1934. Anti-Catholicism and anti-Semitism, all too well expressed in Indiana's Ku Klux Klan revival of the 1920s, illustrated how transcendent religious convictions raised cultural sus suspicions to dangerous heights across the Midwest specifically. The journalist Kerry McWilliams may have exaggerated when in the 1940s he described Minneapolis as the, quote, capital of American anti capital of anti-Semitism in the United States, unquote. But the Scandinavian city was anti-Semitic enough. Reverend William Bell Riley raged from the pulpit of Minneapolis' First Baptist Church against Jews, as well as against communists, Boos, Catholics, and Darwin. Reverend Luke Rader added his voice at Minneapolis' River Lake Gospel Tabernacle, aided by his brother Paul Rader working out of Chicago. And employers and a wide range of Minneapolis' most prominent social clubs commonly excluded Jews. Regrettably, we have few explanations for the decline of anti-Semitism or anti-Catholicism after 1950, whether in the Midwest or elsewhere. 
Perhaps like the rising acceptance of gays, lesbians, and gay marriage in the contemporary United States, it came from knowing some, particularly individual Jewish merchants in so many small and medium-sized Midwest towns. If Irish and German Catholics clumped together, or if they were pushed together in both rural and urban settings, perhaps this is why anti-Catholicism lingered longer, taking its last stand in the 1960 presidential election. My dad, who was a Renville County, Minnesota farmer, clearly didn't understand the danger that a Catholic, a possible Catholic president posed to the nation. So his second cousin, living in the town next to him, uh, sent, kindly sent a little bundle of anti-Catholic pamphlets two weeks before the election. Pamphlets that she obtained from good Midwestern publishers. Two from the Osterhus Publishing Company of Minneapolis. You could get 1,000 of them for $1.50. And one from the Good News Publishers of Chicago. The Chicago publishers were more expensive. You got, only got 500 pamphlets for $5.50. Louis Malls frequently touching 1985 PBS documentary God's Country, which by the way wasn't available for many years, but if you go to YouTube and you type in Mall, that is M-A-L-L-E, and God's Country, G-O-D apostrophe S, C-O-U-N-T-R-Y, you can watch it in segments, I think there are seven, on YouTube. And so you have to sort of be a little creative when you find those segments. I assure you, it's a very, it's an hour to, I don't remember if it's an hour or an hour and a half. It's a fabulous portrait of Glencoe, Minnesota, in McLeod County, Minnesota. And it demonstrates the strange embeddedness of religiously rooted prejudice. Amid scenes that could have been filmed for a Lake Wobegon commercial, a McLeod County, Minnesota farmer suddenly loops into a dialogue about the international Jewish banking conspiracy who explained the Carter-era farm crisis. Was this a Midwestern populist residue, a corruption of Lutheran and Catholic Sunday school teaching about the, death, the re Jewish responsibility for the death of Jesus? It scarcely is surprising that residents of the region that actually housed the nation's earliest mosque in Detroit and Cedar Rapids, Iowa, in the United States, have employed those time-honored modern American bureaucratic techniques of zoning and property regulations to forestall construction of new mosques in new areas of Muslim settlement since the 1990s. Yet the Midwest spiritual landscapes, landscapes have often if scarcely all, always, also provided accommodation, at least across the long run and within larger religious bodies. Lutheran and Catholic congregations first divided by language and ethnicity and, nation, and, and, and nationality. They then slowly coalesced as English began to predominate among second and third generation uh, immigrants and language, language importance receded. Protestants then divided denominationally by theology. First they did it by ethnicity and language, then by theology. Lutherans, for example, producing the ELCA, that is the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, and, more, and the more conservative Missouri and Wisconsin Synod Lutheran bodies, all headquartered in the Midwest. As European languages faded among Catholics, and as income rose, inter-ethnic Catholic marriages rose in the mid-20th century. Then, after 1960, inter-religious marriages rose. After 1950 especially, theological and cultural divides accelerated among both Catholics and Protestants about birth control, homosexuality, and abortion. And by the 1990s, anti-abortion and anti-gay marriage commitments were drawing conservative Midwestern Protestants into previously unthinkable alliances with conservative Midwestern Catholics. In turn, middle-of-the-road and liberal Catholics from European backgrounds also quietly rejected formal church teachings on birth control, abortion, homosexuality, and most recently on gay marriage. No matter the aggressive support that St. Paul Archbishop John Neenstadt gave to Minnesota's proposed 2012 constitutional amendment banning gay marriage, a remarkable number of lawn signs reading another Catholic voting no began appearing in urban areas. And the vote rejecting the amendment in Catholic St. Paul 
was only slightly less than the margin rejecting the amendment in largely, still largely Protestant Minneapolis. Whither then Lake Wobegon, that archetypical Midwestern town? If many Midwesterners wittingly and unwittingly worship at Lake Wobegon's Our Lady of Perpetual Responsibility, no matter their own formal religious commitment, then the Midwest penchant for earnest competence might be considered the region's quiet achievement in outdoing the Puritans in creating the Midwest's viable city on a hill. But the humorous Protestant Catholic tensions resident inside Keeler's Lake Wobegon have roots in anxieties stretching far and running deep. Even as religion everywhere made sense of senseless worlds and created communities far beyond the Midwestern stereotype. In the real Midwest, the diverse religions that bind also chafed and did so across centuries up to our still anxious present. Perhaps this is the quiet enigma hidden inside F. Scott Fitzgerald's elusive and somewhat strange conclusion to The Great Gatsby. In a book that is really never about belief, suddenly belief rears its head in the last several paragraphs. A, a belief about hope, belief about disappointment, or the reality of disappointment, and the understanding of persistence in belief, whether it's hope, or material possessions, or culture, or religion. And I would, as, as Fitzgerald wrote, put it in his, about his failed Midwestern hero, Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther, and one fine morning, so we beat on boats against the current, borne ceaselessly into the past. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I was asked to speak on the development of Midwestern cities, so here goes. Uh, of course, the urban Midwest is a broad, diverse region. Its cities are not cookie-cutter entities indistinguishable one from another. Yet this diversity and individuality, at least in part, veils some common characteristics that distinguish Midwestern metropolises and differentiate them from uh, the principal cities in other American regions. Kansas City, Detroit, Omaha, and Cleveland share certain common denominators that define them as Midwestern metropolises. I'm going to look at what I think are some common denominators today and a common trend in their development. Uh, most notably, the chief Midwestern cities are all creations of the 19th century. The Midwestern network of cities developed during the relatively short period from 1830 to 1890. During these six decades, the region's urban hierarchy uh, emerged with some cities rising to first rank, both regionally and nationally, uh, and uh, development and growth would continue in later decades, but by 1890, the urban winners had secured their positions and the also-ran communities had to settle for a second or third tier existence. In 1830, Cincinnati was pioneering urban life in the Midwest. It was the only Midwestern community to rank among the nation's top 10 cities. And with 25,000 inhabitants, it was five times as populous as the region's second place, St. Louis. Boasting 3,000 residents, Zanesville, Ohio ranked third in the Midwest, with Dayton, Steubenville, and Chillicothe, all in Ohio, uh, holding fourth, fifth, and sixth places. By 1840, Detroit, uh, with 9,000 inhabitants, had moved into third position. Zanesville, however, still outranked Chicago in population, the nascent Windy City barely surpassing Steubenville uh, and uh, New Albany, Indiana. By the close of the Civil War, such also rands as New Albany and Zanesville, though, had dropped out of contention, permanently consigned to small-time status. Meanwhile, west of the Mississippi, Omaha had defeated its 
early rival Bellevue and had dashed the hopes of boosters in Brownsville and Nebraska City for preeminence along the upper Missouri River. To the south, Kansas City was pulling away from Leavenworth and St. Joseph, uh, consolidating its position as the great gateway to the southern plains. By 1890, then, a permanent urban hierarchy had developed in the Midwest. East of the Mississippi, the largest me metropolises were Chicago, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Detroit, Milwaukee, Indianapolis, and Columbus. West of the Mississippi, the chief metropolitan centers were St. Louis, the Twin Cities, Kansas City, and Omaha. Uh, 120 years later, in 2010, the same seven metropolitan areas remained the largest east of the Mississippi, and the identical four metropolitan areas retained their place as the largest west of the Mississippi. What I'm saying then is the urban pattern of the Midwest had gelled between 1830 and 1890. The rank order of the 11 chief metropolitan areas of the Midwest would vary over the decades, with some rising a few notches and others falling. The urban pattern, however, was established. Moreover, during the same period, the Midwest emerged as a major urban region of the nation, with more than its proportionate share of uh, major cities. By 1890, the Midwest accounted for 12 of the 20 largest cities in the United States, as compared to 14 for the Northeast and only four for the South and West combined. The mid-19th uh, century emergence of the urban Midwest distinguishes it from urban development elsewhere in the nation. The East Coast hierarchy of cities emerged uh, basically before the 19th century. In 1800, the largest cities on the East Coast and the Northeast Coast were Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, and Baltimore, and they would remain uh, the, the coastal hubs of the Northeast. The urban development of the South and West contrasted even more markedly with that of the Midwest. The urban pattern in those regions is largely a, a 20th century creation. In 1890, urbanization of the South and West was at most in its nascent stage. The winners and losers in those regions had not yet been determined. For example, in 1890, Florida's largest city was Key West with 18,000 inhabitants. Miami's Dade County stretched 100 miles along the state's southeast coast and was home to only 861 people. In uh, Texas, Galveston was the chief port uh, city, exceeding Houston in population. Dallas was a regional center of 38,000 people and ranked just above Sioux City, Iowa, among the nation's cities. Farther west, Virginia City was the metropolis of, of Nevada. Las Vegas didn't exist. Phoenix, Arizona barely existed with 3,000 residents. And Los Angeles had 50,000 inhabitants, trailing Evansville, Indiana, and St. Joseph, Missouri in population. So the defining, uh, defining urban development of the South and West remained in the future. Now these differing regional timelines of urban development are significant. The Midwestern urban pattern reflects the economic priorities and the technological realities of the period 1830 to 1890. It was an era during which first water and then rail were all important to urban development. Most of the great Midwestern metropolises developed along the major navigable waterways of the region. Moreover, water power was also a significant asset in, that fueled the growth of many Midwestern cities. St. Anthony Falls was the lure that attracted uh, entrepreneurs to Minneapolis. Both as a mode of transportation and a source of power, industrial power, water was a major ingredient in the early development of Midwestern cities. In the second half of the 19th century, railroads surpassed waterways as the chief highways of the nation, and uh, 
and region and provided vi uh, and proved uh, vital to the emergence and growth of uh, the major Midwestern metropolises. Uh, of course, the level terrain of much of the Midwest made it conducive to rapid rail development. And in 1890, mid-sized Illinois boasted the greatest rail mileage of any state in the Union. And Chicago was the unquestioned rail capital of the nation. Also vital to the emergence of Midwestern metropolises were the rich resources of the region. The commerce and manufacturing of the urban Midwest focused on the distribution and processing of native products, most notably uh, iron ore, timber, uh, meat, and grain. Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, and Milwaukee became centers for iron and steel goods, exploiting the iron ore shipped uh, via the Great Lakes from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and uh, northern uh, Min Minnesota. Uh, Chicago, of course, was the chief uh, meatpacking uh, center, but Kansas City and Omaha were challenging Chicago as livestock and meatpacking hubs. Exploiting its water power and, and the development of uh, spring wheat production in western Minnesota and eastern North Dakota, Minneapolis became the preeminent center for flour milling, having surpassed the previous holder of the title, Budapest, Hungary, uh, as early as 1884. Benefiting initially from Michigan's timber resources, late 19th century Grand Rapids was establishing its reputation as the furniture city. Now, as steam power increasingly supplanted water power in the late 19th century, the Midwest did not suffer. Ample coal supplies in eastern Ohio, southwestern Indiana, southern Illinois, and southern Iowa ensured that the Midwest could generate the steam necessary for industrial advancement. By 1890, Illinois ranked second in the nation in coal production, and Ohio held third place. In the late 19th century, iron and coal were deemed the basic building blocks for industrial greatness. With the richest iron ore deposits in the nation and a seemingly inexhaustible coal supply, the Midwest was fertile ground for the growing of industrial metropolises. Now this industrial profile of the Midwestern cities contrasted with that of the East Coast manufacturing centers. Whereas the economic prosperity of the Midwestern cities depended primarily on the distribution and processing of the region's resources, East Coast cities were more often distributors and processors of goods imported from other regions or abroad. Far, rem far removed from any cotton fields, um, Massachusetts ranked first in the nation in cotton milling. The Rhode Island mined neither gold nor silver. Uh, Providence led the nation in jewelry manufacturing, and the small state similarly dominated the manufacture of silverware. The processing of coffee and spices uh, was the leading industry of Brooklyn, and the borough was also the principal center for sugar refining so that the East Coast metropolises were more likely to transform imported materials. The inland hubs uh, of the Midwest built their success on their region's own bounty. With water and rail resources so necessary to 19th century urban development and the mineral f uh, forest and agriculture output basic to the uh, century's uh, economic growth, the Midwestern uh, metropolises thus rose to first rank among the cities of North America. They had what the 19th century demanded of cities, and they accordingly prospered. Now, by 1890, the principal Midwestern metropolises had emerged, and over the following four decades, their place among uh, the nation's cities seemed secure. Uh, this period, 1890 to 1930, is what I call the urban heyday of the Midwest, uh, because it was the heyday for Midwestern cities. They built upon their existing advantages and astounded the nation with new manifestations of their greatness. Most notably, the rise of the automobile industry accelerated the growth of Detroit and made it the wonder of the industrial world. Equally impressive was the rise of Gary, Indiana as a steelmaking center. Midwestern metropolises also continued to expand their existing enterprises. Flour milling in uh, Minneapolis prospered, reaching peak production in 1915-16. Uh, Chicago stockyards peaked in 1924. The city was as yet uh, the unchallenged uh, world's premier uh, meat processor. Cementing uh, Grand Rapids' uh, reputation as the furniture city was the twice annual furniture market 
which attracted manufacturers and buyers throughout the nation in a combination of convention and carnival. Most impressive in advertising the Midwest coming of age were the World's Fairs hosted during the 1890s and early 20th century. Though purportedly intended to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's landing in America, Chicago's World at Columbian Exposition of 1893 was in fact a mammoth celebration of the, of the Midwest's greatest metropolis. Five years later, Omaha advertised its metropolitan status by hosting the Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition. Always sensitive about the, its failure to keep up with Chicago, St. Louis celebrated itself in the uh, Louisiana Purchase Exposition of 1904. Uh, the late uh, 20th century was not, however, as favorable to the fortunes of the urban Midwest. This is a period I call the age of a readjustment for the urban me uh, Midwest. Because the assets contributing to the region's rapid rise in the 19th century were no longer so essential uh, for late uh, 20th century, uh, I mean, no longer so essential to metropolitan growth. Access to water transportation was not a prerequisite in the late, uh, late 20th century. Such fast-growing cities and urban stars as Raleigh, Charlotte, Atlanta, Dallas, Phoenix, and Las Vegas were not on navigable waterways. Railroads still carried much of the nation's freight, but the, 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 they were not as significant as they had been a uh, century earlier. Coal and iron were no longer essential ingredients for economic development. And the agricultural bounty of the Midwest, likewise, was not as sure a foundation for urban prosperity as it had been. In one Midwestern city after another, signature industries closed, eliminating jobs and forcing a rebranding of the city's identity. Flour milling declined in Minneapolis. As Chicago's Union Stockyards closed in 1971, the Windy City was no longer the hog butcher of the world. In 1991, Kansas City stockyards closed, as did the Omaha stockyards in 1999. Meanwhile, furniture makers in North Carolina had supplanted Michigan producers, and the high point North Carolina furniture market replaced uh, the uh, Grand Rapids market as the premier exhibition uh, for, site for uh, manufacturers and buyers. But nowhere was the impact of the decline of a signature industry more evident than in Detroit. The city's name was synonymous with uh, the automobile industry. But in the early 21st uh, century, uh, of course, Michigan's once invis invincible General Motors Corporation went bankrupt, followed uh, again by the bankruptcy of the city of Detroit itself. Once a symbol of uh, the economic dynamism and ingenuity of the Midwest, Detroit was becoming better known for its ruins and empty fields than for its automobiles. The Midwest had been a dynamo of manufacturing production. The new jobs, however, were in service, not production, and consequently, the many ma Midwestern factory towns suffered uh, disproportionately. Detroit was the largest factory town in the world, and it fell the hardest. In other cities, the growth in healthcare, in education, and financial and business cities services, I mean, mitigated the industrial erosion. As state capitals with substantial government employment, as well as giant job generating state universities, the Twin Cities and Columbus, Ohio, both weathered the storm better than many of their fellow Midwestern hubs. Indianapolis and Omaha benefited from being site of their state university medical schools, ensuring an expanding and lucrative healthcare presence. As the a preeminent Midwestern metropolis, Chicago was a focus of financial and business services that buoyed its economy. Yet none of the major Midwestern metropolises was any longer among the urban boom, boom towns of the nation. In the early 21st century, none ranked in the top quartile of the 100 largest American cities when measured by population growth. Moreover, the Midwest share of the nation's largest metropolises had dropped. The heartland accounted for 12 of the top 30 cities in 1890. In uh, 2010, it was the location of only seven of the 30 largest metropolitan areas. 
So uh, through these uh, changing, uh, decades of changing fortunes, Midwestern metropolises have then developed an accord, I think, with a certain common pattern. They emerged between 1830 and 1890 in an era of water, transport, rails, water power, iron ore, and coal. Between 1890 and 1930, cities from Cleveland to Omaha built upon their early successes, and the region led uh, the world in the transportation revolution wrought by uh, the automobile. During the second half of the 20th century, however, Midwestern cities experienced a period of readjustment. Signature industries declined or disappeared. The arid mecca of Las Vegas with no waterways, hog or grain production, coal or iron ore, was the boom town of a nation devoted increasingly to leisure and consumption rather than production. That erstwhile hub of production, the Midwest, has lagged. Thank you. We have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, I think uh, I'll forego my comments and we'll take questions and if there's time at the end, I may take two or three minutes to, to comment on the papers. Uh, the papers were very diverse, uh, covered a lot of changes and we're in their debt for um, some very fine presentations this, this afternoon. Are there questions? I think, I think it's probably true that um, anti-Catholicism was strangely uh, significantly on, on the decline in the Midwest and in at least most other regions. I'm not going to say anything about the South because I'm not quite sure that's quite true in the South, but in any case, in most regions from the late 1940s forward. I, and in some regards, I think I said here that this was the last stand of anti-Catholicism. And I think the potential election of John F. Kennedy really was the last opportunity, as it turns out, for vivid anti-Catholics to really say something. Because it was so dramatic that he would have been the first we'd already had in, had in 1828, the rejection of a Catholic candidate. And this was the first opportunity since then to possibly elect or reject a Catholic candidate. So it was really a peculiar opportunity. Um, why, what accounts for it? I think most historians who deal with it, and regrettably not many do, with the absence of, with the decline of anti-Catholicism, will note several things, and that is anti-Catholicism was frequently tied to ethnic prejudice as well. It wasn't always strictly anti-Catholicism. There were, there were ethnic tensions with, with the Irish, who Protestants thought the Irish drank too much. I mean, let's, who, who's kidding whom? That's what they thought. And um, that, that is, all but German Protestants thought that. <laughs> so, so German Protestants and Irish Catholics shared an interest in uh, beer, but beyond that, they didn't share a lot, okay? Um, then I think there's a merging of the economies. Uh, Catholics began to earn more money. Catholics became more, better educated. They really joined Protestants in, in colleges and universities, especially after the Second World War, and the GI Bill did a lot for that. So just to take those two issues alone, you have some social factors that account for the decline in anti-Catholicism. And as, as I think there is a parallel in, in the current um, issues surrounding homosexuality and gay marriage, what do we see in, this, in the current pattern is that younger people in our society uh, generally are much more accepting of this 
than our older people. And I think that was true in the 1950s and 60s. Younger people mixed, went to school with Catholics, they went to college with Catholics. They didn't seem, they, their grandparents might be suspicious, but they didn't, they, the Catholic kids that they knew weren't much different than they were. And so just the sheer social reality of, of that among younger people in particular take the edge off and, and they drop the bottom out of anti-Catholicism. So that many observers about a current anti-gay um, anti prejudice will say it's a phenomenon largely of older people in the United States and the bottom is dropping out. Uh, among younger people. And the same thing, uh, something very similar happened with, with Catholics. So I think that's how I would account for it. And then after, of course, then after 1960, well, we could start with this. The Pope didn't become the president. Okay, so that, that's what anti-Catholics charged. So that the Pope would become, in effect, the, the major advisor to the President of the United States. That was the open charge about 1960 anti-Catholicism, and so far as one knows, that never happened. And so um, th there you have just reality coming to, coming to the fore. Um, and uh, in a peculiar way, of course, it's also observed by most political scientists that Kennedy's support among Catholic voters was a good thing for him. So anti-Catholicism ironically played into the Kennedy campaign in a very useful way for Democrats and for, for Kennedy supporters because it was, vic it was vicious and it was, it was wh a whispering campaign and it didn't work well. It, it, it looked bad. And then when the Pope didn't move into the White House, that just took the, that, that took the edge off and it has disappeared ever since. So, yes, and I think Novak, if I remember correctly, and I absolutely stand to be corrected on this, that's a comment that Novak has made in the last 20 years about what we're going to describe as contemporary anti-Catholicism among intellectuals. It's a comment that is made by um, I, the, Mr. Donahue, who's the president, um, I don't of the Catholic League makes the same comment that intellectuals are anti-Catholic. And of course that actually goes back to an infamous book published by Paul Blanchard in the late 1940s or early 1950s in, in which Mr. Blanchard, who was a professor of philosophy, uh, really argued vigorously about, about uh, the evils of Catholicism and especially its hierarchicalism. So, so it, in, and it was a kind of intellectual argument, and um, the, the the two are have a kind of causal link, though whether they have an act, what, they have an, a they have um, a theoretical link, but whether there's a causal link, I don't, I I wouldn't say. I'm sorry, Brand Blank. Yes, yes. Yeah, pardon me. Yes, I, I I misspoke. I'm sorry. Yes. Along that same line with the association with the military in the 1940s um, to help explain some of the contacts that you're speculating might have led to the decline in anti-Catholicism. And could that also begin to explain some of the decline in anti-Semitism? Like my mother, my Georgian mother's first love interest was a Brooklyn Jew from Dayton, Georgia. So she was a sure. So you, you've hit on, so I could expand that by making two points. One is during the Second World War, the government very much trained chaplains to discuss the causes of the Second World War among soldiers who came from, we had an enormously democratic draft that simply drafted everybody, all right? 
And so there were all kinds of people who'd never, Catholics, Jews, Protestants, many different kinds of Protestants, evangelical Protestants. And if you're concerned, if you have that interest, you should read Norman Mailer's novel, the, no, the name of which I have, has just fled from my mind, but you'll, someone help me. The Naked and the Dead, all the characters Mailer identifies, it's his great World War II novel. Mailer was, of course, a Brooklyn Jew who had been to Harvard when he's fought in the South Pacific. And all of his major characters are identified by religion in the book. Every one of his major characters is identified by religion. So what was the army to do in 1942 when they had this enormous, with a, in a society that was frequently bitterly anti-Catholic, where there were a lot of, a lot of, lot of anti-Semitism, they argued, the federal government argued in, in training chaplains that what, what were we fighting for, for democracy? And all of our faiths, democracy was based on a common religious heritage among all three faiths. So that's one point. The second point is, is that there was a great intermixing, and not that it was so great, not that many soldiers also didn't come out of the war with, some, with an increased sense of bigotry about Jews and Catholics and Protestants that they met, but it's probably true that many soldiers came out with a greater sense of, oh, I met a Jew, I met a Catholic, I met an evangelical Protestant, and they were pretty nice people. They were pretty nice guys. And um, there are interesting memoirs by Jewish chaplains in particular that go to that point. Yes, if I could add, um, at the beginning of the Civil War, the uh, uh, popular press was still heavily anti-Catholic, especially anti-Irish. And uh, that maintained itself through the Battle of, of Fredericksburg in December of 1862. By late 1864, these same newspapers are, are coming around to a point where they're saying, well, the Irish are earning their way into society. When I grew up in Dearborn, I had a Polish... Um, um, neighbor who was a veteran of the war, and he said much the same thing about, about the um, arrival of Poles in American society. Uh, basically, we fought in World War II, and I had an Italian acquaintance who said much the same thing uh, um, about how Italians flocked to the colors. They were drafted, but they flocked to the colors uh, uh, enthusiastically. Uh, they were loyal to the country, and they earned their way into society. Now, whether or not that's true, I think that was a popular um, uh, uh, view at the time. Yes, sir. Well, um, uh, first of all, I don't, uh, I'm not familiar with the work that you just mentioned. I've heard of it, and so I can't talk directly to that. But, well, I, th I, think, this is still, I think this is still with us, though, uh, even though we've turned our back to the rivers in, in, many, in many cities. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, u it's ubiquitous, and you can see that by the publications. And if anybody wants to make a couple thousand dollars, they get on a they get on some kind of a craft and go down the Mississippi River and then write a memoir, you know. And 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 it keeps it keeps coming back. Uh, the ecology is very important because it it folds into uh, contemporary concerns about the environment and the Mississippi uh, and Midwestern rivers have become a focal point for that. Uh, in, uh, incidentally, I've got an answer to John Butler's query about Southern uh, uh, Catholicism, anti-Catholicism, when, when it ended. It was the 1980s when David Duke uh, decided in Louisiana that the Ku Klux Klan would be open to Catholics there. And, you know, what a, what a pivotal moment in the freedom fight in this country when Catholics could join the KKK in Louisiana. <laughs> Sorry. Way in the back.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, uh, uh, once uh, these uh, certain ethnic groups gain in political power in urban areas, it's less advantageous to be, to be anti those people because those people have the power. And then with regard to the suburbs, of course, uh, everybody is moving to the suburbs. Uh, people of, I mean, you no longer have ethnic neighborhoods so much. I mean, you know, it's no longer the Italian neighborhood, Polish neighborhood. Uh, the kids are moving to Levittown and they're all mixing together. Yeah. Some conspiracy seen in that in the town or the various uh, uh, innovations in government to break down the power of the uh, political wars and uh, political machines and so forth. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Uh, certainly the urban renewal did destroy a number of ethnic neighborhoods. However, to a certain extent, I mean, uh, that's part of the thing, but the other part of the thing is. As people become more prosperous, they don't want to live in the old neighborhood anymore. The old neighborhood looks like a dump to them. You know what I mean? They talk about it nostalgically, but they won't live there. They want at least two bathrooms in their house and a two-car garage and all that stuff. They don't want to live in the, the place their grandparents lived in. And also, I mean, uh, uh, the, the ties to the ethnic culture is not as great. They don't speak Italian anymore. Maybe they speak a few words. Uh, but uh, and uh, so that the ethnic ties are loosened. Yes, sir. I'm not sure. I mean, there's always the urban uh, rural division. However, even that has diminished because, I mean, with modern media, I mean, you, you, no matter where you live, you watch the same TV shows, you're on the computer doing the same thing and everything. It doesn't make so much difference where you live. It's just if you live in the country, you got more land around you. Uh, whereas if you live in the city, you have less. Uh, in, uh, there is a, a more of a common culture than there used to be between urban and rural, I think. And that includes the Midwest. And, and also, I mean, uh, my experiences with the rural Midwesterners, they drive a long, long distance. I mean, they are not isolated. They get in their car and think nothing of driving 50 miles to some place. I guess I would say that as someone who spent 27 years in Connecticut and then move back to the Midwest, move back to Minneapolis, I will just tell you that it's different. Yeah. <laughs> they are not, the East is not, <laughs> it's not the same. And uh, at the same time, a state like Minnesota has a big divide and it's reflected, was reflected in the last elections between truly rural Minnesota, that is the, the areas of Minnesota that are too far from the Twin Cities, principally, to be suburbanized in any way so that property values, farmers can't sell their, their, their farms to, to uh, property developers. Uh, those areas are much more conservative politically than are the, is the big uh, Twin City urban area. And there's, there's actually a growing divide. It was also reflected in the 2012 vote on, the, on both the 
uh, Minnesota um, constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage and on the constitutional amendment to, to have a voter ID for all elections. The difference between the votes in those truly rural, I, I'll, I'll use the word truly rural areas, but I'm worried that one of our, our geographers, Chris Leinhart, is, is going to tell me that I'm not right about that. But I'll call it truly rural areas and these urbanized areas, including the suburbs, was really quite remarkable. So, so there's a, there's, so in some ways, the, an old divide, which I think is old, has reasserted itself in a state like Minnesota, which has these quite different kinds of cultures. Well, the Iron Range used to be, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, I'll just discuss politics. The Iron Range would typically turn out a 70 to 75 percent DFL vote. So in, the, in Minnesota, the Democratic Party is called the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. And that would turn out a, a 70 to 75 percent Democratic vote, almost without fail on, what, on whatever candidate was running. The, the, ironically, uh, now it's probably down into the, into the upper 50s. So the area has become more conservative over the years, and that's why for the past, un, until the last elect, two elections ago, we had a two-year term of a Republican representing the, in the U.S. House, representing um, the, was the congressional representative in that district. But now that's, that, but the person was, uh, not reelected well. It didn't help that his wife moved to Vermont or New Hampshire and uh, took the kids with her, and she has a very high-paying uh, executive job in some way, and this didn't help things. Okay, so but you still don't get a 75% 70, Democratic vote in that in that area. They, they did not like. One of the things that struck me, uh, I've been in Grand Rapids uh, since, um, since I was about seven. My aunt and uncle lived here out on Coville Road. And um, uh, I w came up here many times as I was growing up. And it struck me as a conservative city at that time. Uh, but yet, when I, when I look at the uh, amount of civic engagement, I'm, I'm dumbstruck. I mean, th this city is just chock full of, of city engagement, of, of, of volunteerism, of, of places like this. Um, I, I never saw that before. And when I, when I began to see it about 20 years ago at, at a conference here, I was taken aback. And now that I, I'm in downtown Grand Rapids looking at, at, this, at the university setting, looking at the, I was in the museum the other day. My wife and I went, we went to the art gallery. All these things are new, and obviously they take a lot of money and a lot of commitment. So from my perspective, uh, this may be a, in some ways a conservative uh, town, in other ways perhaps not, but it does seem to be a very socially engaged, civic, uh, civically engaged uh, uh, society that, ha that has a, a, a tremendous respect for civil society, uh, for uh, the, the parts of society that are apolitical or, or perhaps even anti-political in a sense. So I think that that's, a, for me, a, a, a very uh, interesting observation uh, that I frankly didn't begin to see until about 20 years ago. Yes, okay, yes, one more. Well, I would say, first of all, there's, you know, the scholarship on American religious history is also bicoastal. That is, it's mainly a scholarship on the East. Uh, we have some scholarship on the West, and we don't have all that much on the Midwest. So it's not a subject that has attracted a lot of historians. John Jurdy is one of those who, uh, uh, just before he, what he, his last book was a book he was working on on anti, on on anti Catholicism, much of which dealt with the Midwest, not all of it. And then his previous book was on was was about, in a good part, about religion in the, in the in the Midwest. And his book on Norwegian immigrants, of course, dealt with religious questions in both Minnesota and Wisconsin. But generally speaking, the, the big the old line Protestant denominations have not fared well. We have a huge we have a large literature, frankly, on we, we, we have a large literature on Mormonism. We have a large literature 
on uh, Jewish history. We have a reasonably large literature on American Catholic history. Our histories of Protestantism are not so large. And I'm uh, sort of puzzled as to why that is. Um, it is true that most people who write on religious questions have a background in the group that they write on. That's not unusual. That's true in ethnic history, for example. Uh, it's true in the history of nationalities, et cetera, certainly in, inside the United States. But um, you know, I, I guess I'd, I'd close by simply saying maybe the issue has to do with um, something that I know my predecessor at Yale, Sidney Alstrom, who happened to be a nice Lutheran man from Cocado, Minnesota, is alleged to have frequently said in his lecture classes at Yale when he discussed Methodists, he said, well, I can't discuss their intellectual life because a Methodist, in, uh, a Methodist, Methodism, a Methodist intellectual is an oxymoron. <laughs> so um, there, I'll just leave it at that. Are there any other uh, questions or comments then? Yes. Are there any other uh, questions or comments? If not, then let's give our panel a hand and and go to dinner.